Champagne 2018 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Realtors Association, Marshfield Clinic Health System, and Campaign 2018 partner Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Wisconsin and I are covering the elections at the Milwaukee Public Library. Supreme Moore Omakunde of Milwaukee is a Democratic candidate in the 16th Assembly District. Supreme, welcome to Wisconsin I. Thanks for having me. Now, I noticed on your campaign website, you talk about mass incarceration and ending crimeless revocation. It's obviously a very important issue for you. Can you talk about those, please? Sure. Well, mass incarceration, as you know, um, statistically speaking, per capita, we lock up more particularly black and brown folks than anywhere else on the planet. If you look at the United States being the number one incarcerator on the planet and Wisconsin per capita being the number one incarcerator uh, in the country, we're, on, we're locking up the most people on the planet. So uh, we need to end mass incarceration. I'm tired of us having that black guy um, on the state of Wisconsin. And there's a lot of low hanging fruit that we can go after in order to ensure that we can end mass incarceration. One of those things is ending crimeless revocations. I've heard plenty of stories on the doors uh, from friends where someone is five minutes late to see their parole officer and because their bus was five minutes late and their PO is having a bad day that day. So, oh, you're going back to prison because you were late today. Uh, I don't think that all, uh, we should end all revocations. Sometimes people are a threat to our community. Um, and, and I don't want people to you know, be released and think that I can do anything and never go back. However, there are some things that we shouldn't be sending folks back to. Are you committing a new crime? Are you violating some core part uh, of your release? Um, and if the answer is no, we should consider not revocating. Now, and your website says you support closing the Milwaukee Secure Detention Facility. That, does that also mean we shouldn't build a new state prison, sir? Well, I, I think, you know, prison is big business. And, uh, you know, of course, there are those who would support that. I think that closing MSDF um, is a priority because it's just a hazard. Uh, I remember um, someone died there last summer. And um, I, as I was having a conversation about people dying in our county uh, jails, and then someone dies in MSDF, uh, a lot of individuals have come to me, close MSDF, it's in your district, it's in your county district. And my thing is, it's a, well, it's a state facility. I don't have uh, jurisdiction over that. Um, however, uh, some of the same conditions that exist uh, in, in MSDF, uh, I've heard a lot of horror stories. Um, we need to gradually and reasonably bring it to a close. And uh, I don't want people to get lost in the system, though, like someone is supposed to go there and then they get sent there or they're supposed to go there, but it's closed, so they send them somewhere else and then they get lost. But uh, I am largely, largely not in favor of opening new prison systems. We need to do things to pull people out of our prison so that we don't have to build new ones. And uh, that's the route I would go. Should we legalize recreational marijuana and medical marijuana? Yes. However, if we're going to talk about legalization, we must talk about decriminalization as well. Um, they're two sides of the same coin. And oftentimes when we talk about legalization, we don't mention decriminalization. It's kind of a conversation that gets lost at the bottom. Um, and so if we legalize uh, marijuana, if you ask me in the next five to six years, I think it's going to be legal everywhere. There's going to be some kind of Supreme Court case where somebody's traveling from Washington or Colorado or California to a state that prohibits marijuana and it's going to go all the way up and it's going to be legal everywhere. I really think it's important to get in front of the train and say if it's going to be legal in Wisconsin that we have lawmakers and that we have people that get to determine where the money's going to go. And one of the main places that the money needs to go is through our education system, um, through our, our K-12 through schools, our public universities, um, and also our trade and technical schools as well uh, because that's where a lot of people are going to get new jobs and, and uh, MATC has this great promise program, but they're running out of money. And so we need to have another revenue source that can help folks uh, get access to those kinds of opportunities. And primarily has to go towards education, and there may be some other things that we can do with those dollars as well. But if we're going to talk about uh, legalizing, we have to talk about decriminalizing. Everybody that's locked up for marijuana, everybody that's out here with felonies because of their second bag uh, of, of weed, if you will, um, they need to have their records expunged 
Um, they need to get access to jobs, access to housing, and access to educational opportunities. There's so many people that I know who are brilliant, absolutely brilliant, and can't go to school because they can't get uh, funding from the school because they have a drug felony from marijuana. You talked about schools. The MPS four-year graduation rate is 60%. How mm -hmm. can that be improved, sir? Well, there's a number of ways that, uh, that it can be improved. Um, first and foremost, we have to make sure that we are focusing on a culturally reflective education. Um, when I say culturally, culturally reflective, I mean if I'm an African-American student and I don't know who Marcus Garvey is or I don't know who Malcolm X is or I don't know the teachings of some of these great writers um, who, are, who have been in the city and been in our country, uh, I need to know that. I need to have an education that's going to let me see myself. Um, if I am a Latino child, I need to know, I need to know who Cesar Chavez is, who Dolores Huerta is, etc. If I'm a Hmong child, I need to know uh, the relationship between um, uh, the state of Wisconsin and the Vietnam War, etc. Uh, and our history, I need to have an education system that tells me about me. Um, I think a lot of that will help, it, help itself out as long as I'm learning about myself. My interest will grow in reading, in math, in STEM, etc. Um, specifically, we have to inject reading you know, into everything that we do. Like, I love to read. Uh, and there's some, some programs we have, like, I think they're called SWAG or SWAG programs, Super Words are great or things of that nature. Mm -hmm. We just need to inject reading early enough and make sure that it's culturally reflective. There's a great book called The People Could Fly that, uh, that young people, young African-Americans, uh, children should read. Um, and, and, and being able to read to our children at a very young age and introducing them to reading earlier. Choice the Voucher Program, it's been around in Milwaukee since I think 19, well, the 1990s. Yes. Do you generally support it or would you like it scaled back? The Choice of Voucher Program? Yes, Choice and Voucher Program. Well, I see the biggest challenge is, is funding. And so first and foremost, I, I'm a staunch advocate of public schools. And the thing is when we have the Wisconsin ID and the Wisconsin Promise that guarantees us an education through high school, mm -hmm. uh, Everybody's going to end up mostly in a public school, so we have to support where the majority of our children are going to be. Um, I have a problem with the way that Choice and Voucher is funded. It's like the state doles out different uh, bowls of chili, if you will, for different uh, funding purposes. And then, you have, then education gets its bowl, and then Voucher School come along and say, well, we want some money too. And then the state says, well, education, public education, you give them some of your money as well. And also... Choice and voucher schools don't have to take everybody. They get to pick and choose who they want. And at that point, they keep them for a certain period of time and they send them back to the public, uni public schools, rather, and then they get to, and the money doesn't go back either. And so then you're left with, you, you miss that child, the money goes away, and then uh, it come, the, the child comes back, but the money doesn't come back. I have a big problem with the way that they're funded. And uh, there needs to be other opportunities for choice and voucher schools to seek their funding. Do we need to change gun laws in Wisconsin, Supreme? There's some, also some low-hanging fruit that we can go after uh, in, uh, in Wisconsin as well. One of them is the uh, waiting period that we used to have in the state of Wisconsin. The 48 hours for yes, handguns? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it, it serves two purposes. One, uh, it ends like crimes of passion if I'm just upset, angry, and want to go after someone and I want to go purchase a gun and I get it that day. Um, I have, if I have that wait, that cooling off period for two days and I can just wait and then it might change some things. Also, um, it also allows for a more robust background check, et cetera, um, if, if you have those two days to make sure that everything's in the clear. And also if, uh, as you know, I don't know if you do know, but uh, most people know that if you purchase a firearm, that sale is final. Um, you go to the store and take it out of the store, that sale is final. You can't bring it back for a refund and say, hey, uh, you know, I changed my mind about this. And they'll say, well, so all sales are final. Let's say I go to a gun store and, and purchase a firearm, and I leave, and firearms are as much as six, $700. And I leave, and something happens to my car, and I really need that money to get uh, something fixed in my car. Mm -hmm. I can't come back and say, well, I, I want to give this uh, firearm back because I need to get my car fixed. But if we have that two day waiting period and I haven't taken the firearm out of the store, mm -hmm. then perhaps then we can have that conversation. The, um, the, pa the $4 billion in state and local tax breaks for Foxconn. Mm -hmm. Do you think if Foxconn does develop, it'll, uh, it'll provide some jobs for residents of the 16th district? I am not certain that it would. Um, my, I'm leaning towards no though, because 
what's happening right now, there's a lot of advertising in Northern Illinois, in uh, Minnesota, and those are great folks. However, we, we were told that we were gonna get some jobs here in this area, yes. and I'm more concerned about the opportunity for uh, jobs and education in the state of Wisconsin and southeastern Wisconsin, primarily in the, in the 16th district. And uh, I'm also concerned about some environmental challenges that they would have. And um, if we're going to have jobs cleaning things up, I don't think so. However, uh, I, don't, I don't know that it would provide any jobs, long-term jobs. And then are those jobs union jobs? Are those jobs able to be supported, uh, be able to support families? And uh, will they have the right to organize and come together and, and be represented by a union. How would you break the impasse, the gridlock in the Capitol on how to pay for highways and bridges, sir? So, it's a good question. Uh, everyone knows that highways, bridges, et cetera, are important. Um, however, how we get there is, is a big challenge. And I've, I'm a currently a county supervisor and I know how to have conversations with people I normally don't agree with and also to have conversations with people I typically agree with and we have a point of contention and still continue that relationship. Um, we need to make sure that we do what's in the best interest of everyone, state and locally, um, and have a, a local approach and be able to empower local governments also to make decisions on, on highways and, uh, and perhaps even to have local uh, taxing streams where they can have an input in what happens in, on highways and bridges, et cetera, because um, as a county supervisor, I, uh, the, I know that there was a referendum for the county to be able to have a local sales tax so that we can do some things for parks right. and highways and transportation, et cetera, and it would help cure some of the uh, shortfalls that we have there. So I would want to empower local governments also. Would you vote to, to raise the state gas tax or the $75 that you and I pay to register a car, and how do you feel about tolling? So. So you asked like three questions there. Yeah, so, I'm sorry. The gas tax, what, could you see yourself voting to raise it by a few pennies? You're right. I should have gone one by right, one. Right, right. So uh, it would depend um, because with taxes, there's always where the money goes. Um, and I want to make sure that it's going to the right places. Um, so th I'd be open to having that conversation okay. um, with some folks. And, and, and the, the buzz in the capital on tolling, your response? Uh, it depends. Uh, it depends on where it's going, like if it's around Milwaukee or if it's some place that we're not going to yield as much as many dollars and not many uh, as many people are traveling and it's more taxing on the people who live there rather than uh, the people who uh, would travel to as those a, places. As a county supervisor, yes, levy sir. limits, is it time to loosen them or get rid of them on local governments? I think that it's important that... Uh, Whatever levy limits are there, and we at the county board, we try to be very responsible with levy limits. However, uh, I think it's important that we get some of our money back, our shared revenue back from the state and f in local levels in Milwaukee County because that will help to uh, change that, that kind of concept, that ideology if we have more dollars because we're sending a lot to Madison. It's important that we uh, get a lot more back. If that answers your question. Um, Health care. Yes, sir. Does the state government have a uh, role in retaining and recruiting doctors, nurses, and other health care professionals? Sure. I think the, the uh, government has a vested interest to make sure that its citizens, citizenry enjoys the best of the best and, um, and the best practices and, and those who put forth the best practices for their uh, clients, customers. Any thoughts on rural uh, health care in the rural areas mm -hmm. where the demographics, the residents are older, the household mm -hmm. income is less than the statewide average, mm -hmm. young people are leaving health care in the rural areas, sir? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so health care in the rural areas is just as important as health care in urban areas. And uh, as you stated before, if we're going to be recruiting uh, the best doctors, um, the best uh, practitioners, they should be uh, being recruited to all areas. Um, and I want to make sure that there is an equilibrium, a balance of, of, of rural areas and urban areas in what we do uh, as for, for our, the curing of certain things or the taking care of uh, all of our citizens, be they young, old, black, white, urban, rural. And last question, it's an open seat, sure. four-way primary. Mm -hmm. uh, differences between you and your opponents, sir? Well, first and foremost, I think the, the largest difference is that um, I'm currently a sitting county supervisor and I've worked on several things. One, ending mass incarceration. Two, development without displacement as we put millions of dollars into downtown. Um, uh, we 
need to make sure that the surrounding neighborhoods are taken care of and that we aren't pushing people out of their homes. And also, like we mentioned before, the legalizing and decriminalizing of marijuana to pay for education and also to expunge records and end mass incarceration. These are things that I've been working on for three years at the county board. Uh, some of them no, don't, no longer have a county answer, and so I would be glad if I'm chosen to take that fight to the state. Uh, however, I think the other um, thing that distinguishes myself from my opponents is that uh, I've been involved and around this since I was eight years old. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I think that my passion and my clear understanding of the district itself, because if you ask me, the 16th Assembly District is the epicenter of the state of Wisconsin. Um, you have some of the richest people and some of the poorest people um, that live in the same, in the state that live in the same Assembly District. Like we have five through 206 where evictions happen, people get incarcerated. And one day I was knocking doors and, and uh, Jabari Parker of the Milwaukee Bucks was walking his dog. So. Um, we have, you know, a wide variety, and it's the Bucks Arena, 53206, et cetera, are in the district, and we need to make sure that we're taking care of everyone. Um, and it's a real uh, cosmo, if you will, of this entire state, of how we take care of everyone. It's a blueprint for how we can do things right, and if we don't do things right, it'll be the blueprint for how we did things wrong. And so um, I'm best situated to uh, take that fight and represent uh, the 16th Assembly District. Thank you. Supreme Moore Amakunde of Milwaukee is a Democratic candidate in the 16th Assembly District. The primary is August 14th. Supreme, thank you for talking to Wisconsin. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having me.